Good evening, and thank you for joining us. My name is Hank Stevenson. I'm a reporter at the Arizona Capital Times, and I'll be moderator for this evening's debate. The Citizens Clean Election Commission is the sponsor for this event. As a state's voter education agency, Clean Elections hosts debates, so voters have the opportunity to hear directly from candidates, ask questions on the issues that matter most to them, and vote informed. Candidates with a contested general election have been invited to participate in the debate. Candidates who opted into the Clean Elections Clean Funding Program are required to participate, while traditional candidates are invited and encouraged to attend. Uh, the questions that will be asked this evening are coming directly from voters. Leading up to the debates, Clean Elections conducted outreach to voters across the state, soliciting questions for the candidates. Voters watching this debate, this, this debate live, you can submit a question at any time via email, debates at kc-a.com, or you can text it to 928-362-1062, or you can call it in uh, to 480-937-1297. And please specify if your question is for a specific candidate or for all candidates. We screen questions for clarity and to eliminate duplication, speeches, or personal attacks on candidates. This debate will be scheduled for one hour, so we may not get to all audience questions, but we will do our best. Candidates, you have one minute for your opening and closing statements and one to two minutes for your responses to voter questions. We encourage an open exchange of dialogue between opponents. If you feel the need to respond to another candidate's comments, you may do so. I may limit responses for time management purposes, and we remind the candidates and the audience that this is a respectful, courteous, and professional environment. Our goal tonight is to connect candidates and voters so our electorate may vote informed. The candidates tonight for the State House and Legislative District 10, 9 are Democratic Rep. Randy Freeze, Democratic Rep. Pam Powers Hanley, Hanley, and Republican challenger Brendan Lyons. Voters get to cast two votes for the State House races. Um, the order in which candidates will speak has been determined alphabetically. So let's start this off. Uh, Representative Fries, you're our first opening statement. Thank you, uh, Hank, and thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, thank you for Clean Elections again for sponsoring these debates. My name is uh, Randy Fries. I am a physician, uh, a trauma surgeon, uh, ICU doctor here in Tucson. Um, I have been um, uh, in the state legislature for the past uh, this is my third term and I'm running for my fourth term. I'm also a veteran, served in the United States Navy. I'm also a teacher. I teach residents and medical students how to be a doctor and surgeon. Um, I got interested in running for office after the 2011 January 8th shooting here in Tucson, recognizing that as, being, as a trauma surgeon is community service and the shooting helped me realize that I could serve my community in a different way by getting into policy making and uh, influencing uh, public health issues in that manner. Uh, very interested in supporting our public schools, uh, public universities, access to health care, quality health care, and supporting infrastructure here in Arizona, roads, bridges, broadband, things like that. All right. And uh, Mr. Lyons, you're up next. Hank, thank you so much for, uh, for, for hosting. And uh, thank you to everyone who's, uh, who, who's viewing this. My name is Brennan Lyons. Uh, I grew up here in Southern Arizona, attending both public and private school. I pursued a lifelong dream to become a firefighter. On the job, I often responded to the consequences, the tragic consequences of distracted driving. And so it compelled me to launch a nonprofit in 2012. In a sad twist of irony, a year later, I went out for a bike ride with my girlfriend on the morning of her birthday. And a motorist at 45 miles an hour looked down to see who was calling, drifted in the bike lane, and struck us both from behind. Throughout my recovery, I threw myself into fighting for tougher laws. I helped multiple jurisdictions throughout the state in adopting ordinances. Finally, six years later, in a bipartisan effort working with both Republicans and Democrats, uh, Governor Doug Ducey signed Arizona's hands-free distracted driving bill. Uh, in addition to that, I am uh, very engaged in the community. I'm an honorary commander at Davis-Monthan Air Force Base, assigned to the 25th Operational Weather Squadron. I'm uh, 
part of the Emerging Leaders Council here in Southern Arizona. I'm part of the board of directors for Greater Tucson Leadership and uh, part of the Ronald McDonald House uh, Red Shoe Society. I care deeply about our community and my focus uh, priorities are when I'm, the reason they're my priorities is because I've walked around, I've talked to folks in this district and that's their priorities. And that is, we need to increase education funding. We need to protect those who protect us. We should be talking about defending our law enforcement uh, defunding our law enforcement. We need to be defending our law enforcement. And, uh, and I fully support holding bad actors accountable. I want access to affordable and quality health care. And, uh, and my name is Brendan Lyons, and I look forward to earning your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Powers Hanley, you're up. Thanks, Hank. Uh, so my name is Pam Powers Hanley. Um, I'm obviously serving LD9. I'm running for my third term. Uh, I grew up in a small town, Amherst, Ohio. I tell people it's like Benson, but we had Lake Erie instead of the Wilcox Playa, so there's better swimming, right? And, uh, but my, I grew up in a small town in a small house, and my, my parents were uh, workers at uh, unionized factories in, the, in Arizona, and I mean, in Ohio. And what I saw growing up was that uh, we always had food on the table and a roof over our heads. I never had financial or, or uh, housing or food insecurity growing up because we always had those union wages. And I saw the benefits that I had growing up and I see that the many people in the state of Arizona don't have that. Uh, there's too many children in the state of Arizona that don't have food and housing security. There's many people who don't have full-time wages, uh, decent decent wages, uh, decent benefits, uh, paid sick leave, paid vacations, pensions, and affordable college for their children. And so that's why I ran, because I wanted to see the people of Arizona have those you know, basic, basic benefits of life that I grew up with. And so I think that the legislature, uh, there could be a new day in the legislature in 2021 if we really work towards it. And I want to be there to pass the people's to-do list. I want. I think that we should focus on education, healthcare, infrastructure, and security instead of the corporate wish list of deregulation, privatization, and tax giveaways. And so I have spent uh, two years on the Ways and Means Committee. I served two years on banking and finance and four years on health and human services. So with my background with a bachelor's in journalism and a master's in public health, I have a unique combination of somebody who has a questioning mind. I also have a background in finance and health. And I think our priorities in 2021 are going to be resolving the health and finance fallout from the COVID virus. Well, let's get into the questions. First one's a softball. Uh, for you, Representative Fareed, let's, uh, let's just go in this same order for a little bit here. Um, what's your number one priority if reelected to the legislature and what will your first bill be? So my number one priority has always been supporting our public school districts, making sure that they have the funding they need to function, to serve their, our students, uh, because what makes someone successful in life is, is, is a good education. So in particular, uh, with this upcoming session, we have some COVID, uh, cleanup to do. we got to make sure our schools are with dis distance learning, uh, getting the tools they need. I think some of the things that we need to look at are possibly looking at transportation funding. If there are schools that are doing a split schedule and having some students in the morning and then getting them home and then some students in the afternoon, they're going to be transferring and using those buses more frequently. I think we need to be very flexible about our 180 day requirement um, um, in, in getting their schools funding. So we need to get some flexibility there. And I also think that we should look at the, um, the AZ merit is going to be very important for schools to see the effect of distance learning on their curriculum. But I think we should be suspending the letter grades for a year or two to make sure there's no negative consequences uh, associated with that. So those are the things that I'd like to be looking at, uh, particularly for public education in the upcoming legislature. Thanks. Mr. Lyons, what's, uh, what's your fri first priority? What's your top priority and first bill, I guess? You know, th this was addressed in the last legislative session and, and something that is just near and dear to my heart is uh, the cancer bill, the cancer presumption bill. Uh, there was, I, I can't begin to tell you as a former firefighter, how many firefighters that I, I've known who have come down and several even here in Southern Arizona that have lost their lives. There's no reason that, that a firefighter should be denied healthcare coverage when, uh, when studies have proven time and again that, uh, that, that 
there's, there's no reason that they should uh, be forced to say which incident that they received their cancer from. That we need to protect those who protect us. And that's something that's near and dear to my heart. Okay, so um, you, you, you said that's already been taken care of in the last legislature. No, it has not. Uh, forgive me, it did not, it did not make it through the House. So we've put bills on the or laws on the books in, in recent years. I think there was one last year. I'm not sure about this year to strengthen the kinds of to basically say that if firefighters uh, re get develop these kinds of cancers and there's a list of, um, you know, many types of cancers that they're presumed to be on the job. Right. So what are you going to do to further that if it hasn't been um, taken care of in the last year? Well, from what I understand that there's currently loopholes in the system that that don't allow for that coverage to happen. And and that was a bill that was on the table last year. And I want to see that bill make it through the finish line. OK. Representative Powers Hanley, what's your uh, priority and first bill next year? I'll say before I do my priority, I wanted to say that I voted in favor of, of the uh, bills that we had in 2020 and in 2019 for firefighters. and. Uh, adding a big long list of, of uh, diseases or complications uh, to their uh, workman's comp. So anyway, so my priority uh, in 2019, I was doing a lot of, of um, investigation into maternal and child health in the state of Arizona. And uh, what I found was that there were large disparities. And when I really started digging into the data, I found that uh, in 2013, there was a significant drop, like a 12% drop in access to prenatal care across the state. And the drop from African-American women, women was 30%. And so that has never improved under Governor, Governor Doug Ducey. It went down just before he took over. It's never gotten better than about 68% access to prenatal care in the state of Arizona. So we talk about education for children, but some of these children are starting life with multiple strikes against them because they don't have food and housing insecurity. They don't get prenatal care. Many, so too many kids are born low birth weight or, or preterm. And so then they entered school with developmental uh, problems, learning disabilities and things like that. And so I think that maternal and child health touches all of us. You know, We're supposed to be a pro-life state, but we cast off uh, moms and babies uh, in our system because of access to care, food insecurity, housing insecurity, wages, and access to health care. And so although that is my focus is to help moms and babies, part of that issue is helping those moms with their wages. And my first bill would be the Equal Rights Amendment. So um, we kind of talked a little bit about schools. And I think the big question right now is like, Students in K-12 schools are slowly starting to return. I, I think the question that I want to ask you guys is what kinds of resources do classrooms need to do that safely? Do you believe they have those resources? What will you do to ensure that they do have those resources if they don't now? And let's uh, go back to uh, Representative Fries. Okay, Hank, sure. The, um I got the sun in my face for some reason, but the um, uh, I think schools, the resources that schools will need to deal with the COVID uh, pandemic is go are going to be things like personal protective equipment, uh, sanitizing equipment, uh, cleaning equipment. Um, a, a lot of those funds are being spent now out of their classroom uh, monies. And I think that we have to get back to a, a system where we create a fund specifically for supplies like this, not just clean it, but like we had, they used to have uh, capital funding, they used to have uh, m and funding, and they've all, that's all been collapsed down at the general formula, and then there's DAA, but we need to create, uh, get back to a system where pots of money exist for special circumstances like this, um, when, when unforeseen things happen, like um, books and, and computers, right, broadband is now an issue for uh, distance learning. So if we can get, get back to creating some secure pots of money that will be there for an emergency when we need uh, increased spending for something like this, uh, that's the solution I'd look at, trying to diversify where the classroom money comes from instead of concentrating it in one place and expecting that pot to cover everything, including emergencies. That's an interesting concept. So 
where would, how would we fill this pot to begin with? Are we talking about a new revenue source, a one-time appropriation? How do we go about getting that money? Well, I think we should look back at the way that those different pots were originally funded, right? They had a funding stream and then they were collapsed down. I'd, I'd like to explore how were those, how were those, how were those, um, um, accounts funded originally? Where did the money come from? Was it from the formula? Was it from, you know, I, I, some of the money for DAA comes from the sales tax. The rest of the money for K-12 comes from the formula and the general fund and property taxes, right? The general fund is making up for the difference in the, in the, um, uh, in the um, districts that the property tax can't fund their schools directly. So I, I think we have to explore it. Look how it was done in the past. Um, let's get a safety net available for our public schools to have some reserve funding for emergencies. Okay, but this sounds like an ongoing need. Like yes. this yes. would require a revenue source. Sure, absolutely. And I'm not saying I have that source now. I'm saying this is a problem we should explore. This is a problem we should talk about. This is a problem we should all care about across the aisle. And I think that you know you don't solve a big problem like this in one legislative session. The policy making process is most commonly iterative, unless you're sol solving a, a real crisis uh, problem, which is you know, dealt with quickly, hopefully. Okay. Mr. Lyons, what do you think? Our schools are returning. Uh, what kind of resources do schools need to do that safely? And do they have the resources right now? Well, I, I fully agree that uh, personal protective equipment for, uh, for our students is absolutely important to, for the safety and the well-being of our students. Uh, it also brings up a greater need to ensure that our, our uh, public safety and frontline healthcare professionals have the PPE necessary and we don't get into another bind like we did before and worrying about if they have, have this equipment. But I think if one thing that this uh, COVID environment has, has led us to, it's understanding that uh, a lot of this, we're in a digital age and making sure that our rural com communities have the access, the infrastructure, the broadband networks to, to perform uh, online learning. If, if statistics show that, that we get another spike in COVID, just to make sure that those resources are available. And so, yes, I fully agree in making that, that sanitize, sanitization and the cleaning products and the masks are, are fully there for, their, for our students, but also looking at the infrastructure for schools around the state, especially our rural and urban areas. Okay, Representative Powers Hanley. I thought I lost you there for a minute, Hank. <laughs> uh, okay. Sometimes there's a Midtown has been having a terrible connection problems with the internet. So uh, yes, I, I agree with um, Lions and Freeze. Uh, you know PPE, yes, but I, I think that we really have to um, we have to prepare for a COVID chronic world, right? We have to realize that we could be with this for a long time, and so I think that PPE is one thing, but if that's going to be in the mix, that's a continuous expense then, right? And so what, what else could we do? For example, you know, there are hospital grade air filters that schools in other states are putting those into their schools to try to make the whole school safer. Uh, and, I, and I think that especially for some grades, like maybe the older grades, to rethink whether or not they actually need to be there five days a week. I mean, I, I think that this, uh, the COVID a virus is basically the ultimate disrupt disruptor, right? In uh, business today, they talk about business disruptors and how innovation comes from disruption. So what sort of innovation could we should, could we put towards the school system, right? Uh, our current school system, it really hasn't been around forever, you know? So what could we do to innovate it? And I think that uh, rethinking school, uh, how could uh, the internet still be part of school? Um, but how can we save some of the parents who are trying to work at home and have two or three kids trying to do school at home? I mean, we definitely have to, you know, bring the students back. We have to bring them back safer. And we have to do, like, like Free said, I really agree with the idea of, of maybe suspending the grades for a while. Um, I saw a friend on internet who said that uh, her grandmother's senior year in high school was cancer, canceled during the flu uh, in, in 1918. So I think we need to look outside the box regarding, um, regarding school. And as far as funding, uh, I saw on the internet today that uh, there was a press release, I think from Governor Ducey and Kathy Hoffman 
uh, talking about more money for schools uh, for COVID uh, in the state of Arizona. So that was a good thing. Um, I also think that perhaps we could put together a little bit of a plan for Governor Ducey on how to spend these things and how to how to work with the schools. Because right now the whole virus response is being done by executive orders. Uh, for purpose of clarity, I, I'd like to understand, what do you mean suspend grades? The, the letter grade, okay, so AZ Merit is, is a test and, and each school is assigned a letter grade depending upon the, uh, the student's performance. Um, I think, and then there are some negative consequences based on that letter grade. So I think we should assess the performance and the effect that distance learning has on that performance, but yet uncouple that data collection and that important understanding of what the effects of distance learning is uh, or are uh, from the negative consequences of a letter grade. Okay, I just want to ensure that we're not holding students back. No, 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 this is the, the, okay. the school district's letter grade. Thank you. Well, and, and to follow up on that, I mean, um, no negative consequences come to mind, but there is performance-based funding that's based on those letter grades. Uh, you know, schools, especially high poverty schools that receive an A on their letter grade, get additional money for getting that grade. What do we do about that? I mean, do we suspend that funding model in the meantime too? Uh, you should run for office, Hank, because that's a really good solution. I, I, I don't care for uh, the results uh, based for, uh, funding. Uh, I think that program is uh, shifting money um, uh, away from schools that need the resource to solve problems. So I would agree with suspending that results based okay. program. So Pandemic or no, you want to get rid of that results-based fund. I would like to take that money and put it back into the formula and distribute it to all schools and instead of focusing it on certain schools. Gotcha. Yeah, I believe that's like $65 million and the Democrats have been trying to get rid of that forever. Well, then let's ask Mr. Lyons, do you support uh, performance-based funding metrics? I do support uh, uh, funding based upon uh, performance. Uh, absolutely. I think it, it should follow the student. Uh, I think time and again, we've seen uh, achievement when, when that funding is followed uh, by the students. Okay. So I've got a number of questions that are all kind of the same here. Um, what people want to know is with the pandemic raging, um, how will you reform election systems to ensure that elections are fair, safe, and accessible during the pandemic. And I don't, I don't necessarily know that there is a lot the legislature can do considering we are less than two months out from the election. Um, so I guess like maybe the question, maybe the way to take this question is, uh, should every voter, you know, a big part of the debate over uh, going to the polls in the pandemic has been just, should we or should we not adopt universal uh, mail voting? Arizona has a very liberal pebble system, a permanent early voting list that anyone can sign up for. Um, but I think, I think the, the question that makes the most sense to me is, should every voter be sent a ballot regardless of whether or not they're on the pebble for this election cycle and election cycles to come? And let's go back in the regular order. Do, uh, Representative Freeze. Sure, that, uh, Hank, thank you. That was one of our, uh, the Democratic caucus's um, solutions during the last week of session. Uh, we wanted to run an amendment that says every registered voter should get a ballot in the mail. And then it can be up to them how they use that ballot. They could you read it at home and then be prepared to go and vote in person very quickly. They could fill it out at home and mail it back, or they could fill it out at home and drop it off, many options. Uh, as you said, Arizona has a very robust vote by mail system, been around many years. We call it Pebble, other states call it absentee ballot. It basically means you get your ballot at home in the mail, you fill it out and you can either drop it off, return it by mail. 85% of people in Arizona are on the pebble. We would simply be expanding that by 15% more. I think that's very doable. Other states, it could be a great big problem that only have 5% absentee ballots. Arizona is in a position to have done this very safely, very easily with a little bit more expense, not a whole lot, uh, but we chose not to. Mr. Lyons? Yes, uh, I, I don't believe that this. I don't believe that this needs to be a universal mail-in ballot system. If it's indicative of our primary election, 
I believe it in Pima County here, uh, uh, 90%, and it might even be throughout the state, but 90% of ballots casted were mail-in ballots. Um, I, however, to mandate something like that, I think that the choices still need to be available for those who feel comfortable going in person. As far as uh, utilizing our resources and our funds that to just send out uh, mail-in ballots to everyone and just give them that choice, I think it should still be requested. I, I, I think give people that choice, give people that option. Um, you know, and again, if it's, if it's, if it's indicative of our primary election, people are going to do what they want to do. And 90% are going to do mail in anyway. Okay. Real, quick, uh, real quick, if I might just address something, it's not mandated, Brendan, it is, oh, right. it is still a choice. You are just receiving your ballot in the mail. You Correct. still have a choice. I can go and vote in person if I wish. I can fill my ballot out and mail it, or I can go and drop it off. You still have a choice. And it's only mailed to registered voters, not everyone. Right, Rand, R Randy, uh, correct. Uh, I believe Hank asked the question if, should it be? And so I do not believe it should be. I think as long as people can maintain that choice, uh, whether they feel the security of their ballot, um, you know, that, 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 uh, that depends upon, uh, that changes the whole trajectory of our state and policy, so. Rep Powers, what do you think? Uh, yes, and so um, I believe that Katie Hobbs said that the ship has already sailed on sending out ballots to everybody. It's probably past the print date. Uh, and I, I do agree that I think the Pebble system is, is a great system for everybody listening out there. Uh, this is September 15th and you still have a few more weeks to sign up for the Pebble and sign up for permanent early voting and to register to vote. Uh, I, I do think the system is safe. Uh, LD9, I mean, I think we're even over 90%. I mean, we have a huge uh, percentage of our population on LD9 that's already on the pebble. And so I, I hope that more people will get on it as far as going to the polls. Uh, luckily our COVID numbers are better now than they were, you know, in July. And so I think, uh, you know, as, as Randy suggested earlier, you know, be prepared when you go to the polls so you know exactly who you're going to vote for so you can get in and out, wear a mask. I even wear gloves to places. And so I think that there's ways to do this. Um, as far as going forward in the future, uh, there are things that the legislature could do to make it easier to vote, that's for sure. We could take off some of the restrictions. We could stop some of the voter suppression. Uh, we could suggest all mail-in ballot, uh, uh, you know, as a legislative, as a legislator. We could put it on the ballot as the legislature. So there's all sorts of things that we could do when we get back in session. And right now we're mostly encouraging people to sign up for Pebble. <laughs> and, and Hank, I'll say that uh, I did vote in person and I really want to applaud our poll workers because the efficiency, I was in and out in no time. There were, there was no wait time at all. So I, I really applaud our poll workers for for the, the cleanliness, for the, taking the safe precautions. And I just wanna add that. I'd also like to say that I appreciate our poll workers, but I also wanna keep them safe. And the fewer people visiting the polls, the safer the poll workers will be. Usually our poll workers tend to be older Arizonans doing uh, their civic duty and, 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 and have the time to, to be there for the uh, election day on a Tuesday. But I believe strongly the fewer people that show up at the polls, the safer our poll workers will be. So another COVID question, Arizona's unemployment benefits are among the lowest in the nation at just $240 a week. Uh, these benefits have been bolstered through uh, the pandemic from federal emergency dollars that are running out. Should the state increase its unemployment benefits? If so, to how much and how should we pay for it? Let's start with you, Representative Fries. Uh, yes, we should be increasing our unemployment benefits. This is just another situation where Arizona is second to last or last in uh, providing um, uh, services to our citizens that need a little help or assistance. Uh, we should be increasing it to about $490 a week, which will get us around uh, the 50 percentile level as far as the rest of the states goes. And, you know, how do we pay for it? Well, we pay for it like we do. Um, you know, we will have to uh, talk about how we draw money into the unemployment trust. It's usually on the first um, X amount of dollars of the paycheck uh, that someone's getting. Uh, we might increase that uh, a small amount and actuarially figure out how much that will increase the unemployment trust. Uh, uh, th this is an issue that Arizona has, again, been uh, last in the nation on supporting our most needy. 
uh, people that can't pay the rent, people that can't pay the uh, utility bills, and people that can't, parents that can't put food on the table. Uh, we need to be getting ourselves in tune with the rest of the country and 490 would get us around the 50 percentile. First of all, I'm, I'm certainly encouraged by uh, seeing the trend in, in getting back to uh, a normal and, and encouraging people to get back to their jobs and working environment. I'm seeing the trend in our numbers uh, either stabilize or start to decline. Um, you know, so I'm really encouraged. All right, so we had some technical difficulties. If we lost you, uh, we apologize. We're trying to start over in about the, the uh, time spot that we think we lost uh, the stream. So uh, last I remember, I was asking Mr. Lyons about increasing the unemployment benefits. You said you did not want to increase them at this time. Let's, let's try to do that one over, if you will, Brandon. Certainly, I'm, I'm certainly encouraged by our numbers, uh, our, our COVID numbers stabilizing. And so right now I wanna see people getting back to their jobs. Uh, I, I don't support uh, increasing those, uh, those benefits at this time. 
All right. So, um, and that means that we still have to get back to you, Representative Powers Hanley, to answer that question. You said you wanted to increase those benefits. Uh, yes, Hank, I agree with Dr. Freeze that um, it doesn't do us any good to have be one of the stingiest states in the country. And so I agree with raising unemployment to about the, the middle, about the average or so. And in fact, that's one of the things that I've asked many times. What would it take to get the state of Arizona from the bottom of the list in number 50, which is where we have been under the current majority, and go to 25, 25 in you know, unemployment, 25 in TANIS benefits, 25 in education funding. You know, I don't like living at the bottom of the barrel. That was not the way I was raised to be settled for last. And so I think that uh, bringing that up to the average would be good. We need to give people enough money to live on. Our, our government, our, our general fund is primarily based on sales tax and handouts from the federal government. And so if people don't have money in their pockets, and at $240, you don't have much money to buy anything, even food. And so if they don't have enough money in their pockets, they're not going to be able to, to buy. And that's not good for business if people don't have money to buy. Uh, and so as far as paying for it, I would get rid of the unnecessary lawsuits. We pass far too many uh, bills that are unconstitutional uh, just to make a point, just to run it up to the, to the Supreme Court. I think that's a ridiculous waste of time and money. I would also review the tax giveaways and have a moratorium on tax giveaways while we're trying to dig our way out of the financial and public health consequences of COVID. Uh, I'd also, there's plenty of things I'd get rid of out of the general fund, like results-based funding that helps rich schools. That's about $65 million or more. Uh, the Freedom Schools from Koch Brothers, those are around 10 million. And there's plenty of other things in the general fund that as far as I'm concerned are a waste of money. And that's how we'd pay for the unemployment. Okay, this question is from a viewer. Um, I really like this one. It's simple. What do you think is the biggest state issue that is not getting the attention it deserves? And let's switch up the orders. Representative Powers Hanley, you'll go first. Oh, well, thanks. <laughs> well, I, you know, I might go back to maternal and child health because when I started talking about that, everybody's like, oh yeah, that'd be nice. You know, but then when I really, I did huge presentations in Tucson and, um, and wrote several articles about it. And when people actually saw the data and saw the disparities in, in public health, and these, these people are on Medicaid, they're on the state program, right? And so uh, also when I started crunching the numbers, it wasn't only that access to care went down so dramatically and access to uh, pre preterm, um, I mean, first, you know, prenatal care went down. And so premature birth went up, low birth weight went up, particularly amongst women of color. And so what happens when, you know, people who are um, on access have babies, the state of Arizona pays for it. And so by not giving prenatal care, we are actually spending billions of dollars or wasting billions of dollars in the nursery intensive care unit because we have too many preterm babies. And so uh, that is an issue that I think that nobody is really looking at. You know, we have a dismal system and we really haven't done anything to improve it. You know, we have a lot of uh, programs that sound good, but the cut, cut funding was cut so dramatically by the Tea Party in 2010, 2011 and never restored. And so we have sound, things that sound good that don't have enough money to impact the population. All right. Mr. Lyons, what's the thing nobody's paying attention to that they should? Well, uh, and, and I think people are certainly paying attention to this, but I, I, I believe that more attention needs to be garnered at increasing literacy in Arizona. Uh, currently, I believe we're 45th in the nation, and that needs to be improved upon dramatically. And, and also, as it pertains to education, our workforce development programs and trade schools and, and supporting programs like right here in our backyard, Pima Community College and JTED, absolutely getting people to work, getting people to uh, to. To, to participate in these trades because we're, we're seeing the trades dwindling uh, throughout society and we got to get back to that. I would say uh, public safety uh, in particular, um, responsible gun ownership legislation, gun safety legislation. Um, the majority of people in this country, the majority of people in this state want this, their legislators to discuss and create solutions to this problem. Uh, people are dying. Um, I have seen an increase in the gunshot wounds that are coming through the ER just since the COVID uh, pandemic. 
uh, things like uh, a safe storage legislation requiring that you store your gun safely at home. I have taken care of young children going to visit their friends and neighbors, reaching up onto a table to, and find a weapon on a, on a table, pull it down and shoot themselves in the chest. Um, um, uh, background checks, background checks for every gun purchase. This is 2000, uh, this is 2020. Uh, background checks takes minutes. It will not slow down your ability to purchase a weapon if you have no reason to be on um, um, uh, a prohi prohibited possessor list. So I, I think this is something that the electorate wishes that we would talk about, but we have turned our backs on it. We have uh, ignored it and we have uh, failed to do our job in this area. So I want to ask you guys about invest in education, the uh, Prop 208, um, which aims to put about $900 million annually into K-12 education by increasing the tax rate for those earning more than $250,000 or a half million for couples. I bet I can guess your positions. Uh, so if you say that, yes, you are going to vote for this, my question is, is that enough funding to solve schools budget problems or do we still need more? If you are not going to vote for this thing, do we need to increase state funding for public schools and what is your plan to do so? And let's go back to uh, Representative Powers. Yes, uh, thanks Hank. Yes, I, I do support the Invest in Ed. Uh, in fact, I collected signatures for it in 2018. It was sad it didn't get on the ballot then. Uh, too much of our tax system in the state of Arizona is based on sales tax, and uh, that was the other alternative that was proposed, was raising the sales tax. We had a bill, at least one bill like that in the last couple of years, and uh, I think that uh, putting a fee on incomes over $250,000 and couples over $500,000 uh, helps us uh, equalize our tax rate a little bit. And not be so reliant on sales tax, which is a primarily a tax on the poor. And so, yes, I, I do support it wholeheartedly. And was there another part to your question or was that The it? real question was, is that enough? Are we done? Yeah, okay, is that enough? So uh, Invest in Ed was crafted before the COVID virus, right? And so I think uh, it's projected to bring in uh, a little under a billion dollars. And so it will help a lot. Now, will it will it help the schools, you know, expand broadband and have a response to COVID? I don't think it'll do that far. It won't go that far. It's going to help them, you know, get to where we thought we wanted to be before COVID. Okay. Uh, Hank, Hank, educa Hank, education is absolutely one of my top priorities. I do not believe that Invest in Ed Prop 208 is a solution to do so. Uh, we, First of all, there's a lot of waste, fraud, and abuse happening throughout our school system, uh, the overhead on, on stuff. I'd like to see our teachers get paid uh, the national median by 2022. I would love to see that. Um, you know, and, and frankly, Republican Kate Brophy McGee had championed a, uh, a bill that was a, to increase the half cent sales tax. You know, here's an opportunity that um, by, by putting a 78% increase on taxes of those who, individuals who make more than $250,000, that's our small business owner. That's going to put people, uh, the reason why Arizona thrives and growing so well is because our, of our pro-business legislators that uh, have, have applied policies like transferring licenses here, growing that business. When we, when we increase that tax base on those people, they're going to go elsewhere. And, uh, and that's why our economy continues to grow and thrive. And so for those reasons, I vote no on 208. Okay, so the question was, if you're voting against this thing, what is your plan? Do you think that schools need more money? And what is your plan to do so? Right. so you said yes right. to the first part. What's the second part? Uh, well, the answer was no to my uh, no to my, the first question on 208. Yes, schools need more funding. I would look at things like waste, fraud, and abuse. Uh, see where we could, uh, you know, pull pull from money and allocate that for teacher funding, uh, technical technology pro programs. Um, but in addition, you know, I, I would be open to exploring uh, the proposal by uh, Republican Kate Brophy McGee. That's half cent sales tax. I think that was an opportunity that that unfortunately was shot down. If I remember correctly, she was talking about expanding uh, Prop 301, which is a 0.6 cent sales tax to a full penny. Correct. Uh, 
Um, a penny basically pulls in a billion dollars. So, you know, it getting that, that would be if we expanded it to a full penny, I think it was extended but not expanded. Um, that would be about $400 million, give or take. So, thank you. That, that's correct. Yes. Thank you. Representative Freeze. But if people don't have enough money to buy, sales tax isn't going to do you any good. And if people don't have jobs, we're not going to have sales tax. Right. So sales tax isn't going to do you any good. <laughs> the sales tax is also extremely regressive, right? I mean, the, the uh, invest in ed proposition is, is a more progressive way to fund our <laughs> schools. It is a three, it is, I believe, a 3.5% surcharge above $500,000 for a married couple filing jointly or $250,000 for a single person. So you do not pay a single penny more in taxes if you are a single person making less than $250,000. It is misleading to say that this is a 70% sales tax increase for everyone. It is not. It is, if you pay, if you make $501,000 and you are a married couple, you pay $30 more in income tax. That's it. So the more you make, the more you're going to pay. It brings in $900 million. That's what the economists are saying. I would like to first, before I do any adjustment of our school fundings, number one, we shouldn't be supplanting, would be supplementing, right? So I would first make sure that this money brings in what we expect, right? So we need to have a good year or so to make sure that this robust funding is truly there. Some of it is already committed for certain things. The invested ed um, statutes uh, as, as written, I believe, commit some of portions of this money for the classroom, for teacher salaries and things like that. So we have to be very careful that we're not supplant, supplanting the formula that already exists. Um, uh, Arizona has a long way to go to get our schools where they need to be. Uh, we need to be educating our students and giving them a quality education no matter where they live. And there is some disparities in our public schools, although there shouldn't be. Uh, and, and that is brought out by some of our tax credit programs like the public school tax credits, the student tuition organization tax credits that give public money to private schools. So I support Prop uh, 208, Invest in Ed, because our schools are in dire straits and we need a solution now. I do, I, I'm not going to, I am not going to disagree with Mr. Lyons and say we have some things to look at and make sure that we're spending appropriately. We don't have um, a, a redundancy. That needs to be done as well. But we need a solution in the next year or two to save our schools. And I believe that 208 will do that. So the, is it enough, though? I mean, if we put another billion dollars, are the Democrats going to say job done, well, job well done, or is it going to be a, another tax increase two years down the line? Uh, you know, you always have to reevaluate uh, a program when it's put into place. You got to make sure it's doing its job. You got to you got to see how well it's doing its job. Is it failing to do its job? Um, as I said, we can't supplant the formula, but I think another nine hundred million dollars is going to create programs, decrease our classroom size. That's a huge thing. All the science and studies have demonstrated that the smaller the classroom size, particularly in the early education years, improves outcomes in the later years. So if if, if all Invest in Ed does is reduce class size from 35 down to 25. We've won. We've huge success. I, I'd can also. I, I would say, can I make a comment on the small businesses? Uh, so most, by the vast majority of small businesses in the state of Arizona are sole proprietors. And I have had two sole proprietorships in my, in my adult life. And my husband currently has a sole proprietorship. And, you know, I know a lot of people who have the, have small businesses they don't earn anywhere new near $250,000. And if I made that much with my PR business, I would have been ecstatic. And so the vast majority of small business owners are not going to be affected because they don't make more than $250,000 a year or more than $500,000 as a couple. And that's their personal income, not the income personal of the business. Income. It's their personal income. That is taxed. I believe Mr. Lyons wanted to get business. in here. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge that the legislature has invested more than $4.5 billion in new K-12 through education dollars since 2015. I think that's something to applaud. That's something to commend. We are far, far from the national average, and much more can be done. I, I just want to uh, take a moment, and uh, we're not going to get everything that we want overnight. This is, uh, you know, I didn't get everything I wanted in the distracted driving bill. Uh, you know, as long as we continue to move in a, in a, in a forward momentum, I support that. And I'd like to thank the Save Our Schools and Red for Ed movements for getting us to finally wake up and reinvest in our schools.
Okay, unfortunately, we are running out of time. I want to ask quickly, um, maybe I can squeeze in another one after this. Are y'all going to vote for the safe and the smart and safe Arizona Act, which would legalize recreational marijuana for adults? And um, let's start with Mr. Lines. Sure. Uh, you know, as, as it pertains to recreational use of marijuana, I'm a, I'm a public safety advocate. And, you know, I, seeing somebody an additional thing of somebody being impaired behind the wheel that's that's not something i can get behind but if the voters go to 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 vote in favor of this you know i'll see how how can we leverage those th that revenue those dollars to support things like education to support things like public safety so but me personally my voters know all right the reps you want me to go i'll go, go ahead <laughs> Uh, so yes, I support uh, Smart and Safe. Um, I, Dr. Fries and I uh, helped, uh, we were in the negotiation on that bill. Uh, what came to us at first was the sort of like the 2016 version. Uh, and this was expanded with lots of meetings and include, includes lots of, lots of good things, right? And so I see uh, possession of marijuana and legalization of marijuana as a mass incarceration issue. There are far too many people in jail uh, for simple possession, you know, we found out from, you know, we had Marilyn Rodriguez on our LD9 town hall a few weeks ago, and we found out that most people who are in jail, uh, they don't, they never even wrote down how much pot they had, right? And so people are in jail for a little tiny bit of marijuana plus a kitchen sale, a kitchen scale gets them a tent to sell. And so that's not fair. You know, this is a this is a plant, a medicinal plant that never killed anybody. It's been used safely for centuries. And so, yes, I think that this is a mass incarceration issue and we're wasting way too much money on locking people up for a plant that never killed anybody. And, and yes, Hank, I, I do support recreational use, legalization of recreational use. Um, Power, uh, Representative Powers Hanley referred to decriminalization and expungement. I think those are very important parts of Proposition 208. But I do have some concerns about how uh, 208 is administering and, and executing um, the uh, legalization. It's, they're throwing everything at the Department of Health. I think it's way too much for one administration. I actually wrote my own bill to try to get us to um, think about this in a different sense. Um, we should be tracking uh, that marijuana sales, just like we track alcohol sales. Uh, we should be, um, um, be being very careful about uh, our tax revenues. Are we collecting enough tax revenues? Uh, we, we have to be careful about that window. If it's too high taxes, then you have a black market problem. So, um, you know, it's, I, I think that there's a lot in this bill that I'm concerned about how they're executing the plan, but I see it as the only way to get Arizona to uh, see this, uh, see this uh, to fruition. Uh, if I may, I'm, I'm glad that Pamela and, and Randy had brought up uh, uh, the mass incarceration issue. I fully support criminal justice reform. And although I don't support uh, recreational use of marijuana, you know, seeing that on, I believe it's on average uh, 10, roughly $10,000 follows our students. Uh, 20, I think, I believe it's $25,000 follows our, uh, those who are incarcerated. And, and you know, something that I don't support is private, pr uh, private prisons that mandate, I believe it's 98% of an occupancy. You know, I think looking at our nonviolent offenders, how can we, how can we get, the, get them back into society, becoming contributing members of society? I fully support that. So although I vote no on this recreational use, I do support criminal justice reform. So I know that um, some of the candidates have to go. So I guess we'll have to leave it there as much as it pains me not to get to these other questions. Um, so let, let's go in the same order um, for the closing comments that we started off with. That way uh, nobody gets both the first and last word. So uh, Representative Freeze, you're up, closing comments. Sure, thank you, Hank. And again, thank you, Clean Elections. Thank you everyone for uh, watching. Uh, thank you for being an engaged, informed voter. There's nothing more important than an informed voter during an election. I have been pleased and proud to represent LD9 uh, in the last six years. In the last four years, I've served as the assistant uh, Democratic leader, uh, working uh, you know, to liaison with our um, Republican colleagues across the aisle. Um, I'd be honored to, again, uh, serve 
to, to meet the, uh, represent the values of LD9 and, and meet the needs of our district uh, up in, in the Capitol. Uh, again, I strongly support uh, our public schools. Uh, I strongly support access to health care, quality health care for everyone. Uh, we talked about public safety, responsible gun ownership, uh, and I also um, want to support uh, building our infrastructure, roads, uh, uh, broadband, uh, supporting the environment, protecting Arizona's water uh, resource, a very important here in the desert as we grow. Uh, so again, I, have, uh, I feel like I've got quite a bit of experience to represent this district. Uh, served on the Appropriations Committee for four years, uh, been active in, in, in working with uh, the Republicans to try to represent the budget in a bipartisan way, and looking forward to continuing to do that for the district. All right, Mr. Lyons? Well, as I mentioned, you know, I, I served in this community as a former firefighter, and although my, my uh, career as a firefighter may be over, I'm not done serving. I want to serve as your representative for Southern Arizona. You know, I worked across the aisle and getting the distracted driving uh, bill across, and I want to continue that momentum to have an open door policy to work with both Republicans and Democrats on issues facing our state, such as public safety, education, growing jobs in our economy, access uh, to an affordable and quality health care as well. And uh, frankly, I'm, I'm really proud to stand beside Randy and having earned uh, the endorsement of the Tucson Metro Chamber, the endorsement of the Southern Arizona Home Builders Association, and the endorsement of AZ Cops, our, our law enforcement. So uh, I'm really proud of that. And, and to showcase that, hey, this isn't Republican versus Democrat, I'm proud to stand beside you and having earned those endorsements. Thank you. I look forward to earning your vote. All right. Representative Powers Hanley. I muted, muted myself because my husband was getting some crackers and chips out. <laughs> anyway, so uh, thank you for hosting us tonight. And I really appreciate the Clean Elections Commission for doing this. Um, as I said earlier, I'm running for my third term. And when I first ran for the House, I, I told people that as a clean elections candidate, I was not going to be owned by the lobbyists and that I would use my voice and my votes to stand up for them. And that's exactly what I did. I, I I'm an avid debater and I ask questions of everybody. Anybody who comes in my office is gonna get a reporter's type of uh, questioning from me. And so uh, in 2020, I proposed uh, sweeping legislation based on the social determinants of health to improve maternal and child health and improve our standing in adverse childhood experiences. We are at the bottom again with adverse childhood experiences and when kids start to school, they start school with many strikes against them if they have food, housing, and financial insecurity in their little lives when they're growing up. And so I think that rather than focusing on helping businesses and giving away taxes, what about if our goal is to have every child in the state of Arizona have food and housing and financial security? I think that would be a good goal for the legislature in the future. And so I hope that you'll take a look at my website, powersforthepeople.net. I have a lot of videos and blog posts and information about my stances, including my list of endorsements. And so um, have a great evening, everybody, and thank you for tuning in. Thank you so much. Um, all right, I've got a script here. This concludes our debate. To our candidates, we thank you so much for participating. To the voters, we thank all of you who took the time to watch the debate and inform yourselves before the November 3rd election. The Citizens Clean Elections Commission is your source for nonpartisan voter information. We encourage you to visit azcleanelections.gov for all your voting needs. And thank you so much to the candidates for taking the time to do this. We appreciate it. Thank you, Hank. Thank you.